We would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University, a partner of Blue Metropolis, is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyangehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojake, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And on that note, welcome. And it's a pleasure, an honor, a delight to introduce uh, you readers to these fabulous, fabulous writers, which among many things that write about lives, biographies, uh, biographers, um, Rosemary Sullivan here in Canada and Raquel Martinez Gomez across the pond in Spain. We are again, I cannot be more um, thrilled about this conversation which happens in the context of Spain receiving the torch from Canada of Guest of Honor in Frankfurt at the Frankfurt Book Fair. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the experiences and the importance of having these um, platforms to showcase our work. But first, let's talk and meet these wonderful writers who above even being a, a wonderful writers are wonderful women who I happen to know and love very much. And I have to say, you know, this is one of the perks of my job. I do get to work with uh, fantastic women. So um, my first question, and we're, start, we're, we're starting with Rosemary here in the Colonial project known as Canada. Yesterday, Jorge Carrion said the colonizer project of Spain and the colonial project of Canada, um, because uh, these, these concepts of nationhood, you know, are interesting, you know, because it's, especially when you have writers that write about writers from other cultures, which is what we're going to be talking, touching on a little bit today. So, Rosemary, I want to begin with you, you know, I'd like you to talk to, um, to you in general. For, uh, I'm sorry, I would like to ask you, a more general question about the experience of writing about real stories and characters vis-a-vis -vis, because again you are a poet you are you work in poetry and in fiction and in essay but you also write about real lives so just you know share with us and again you have a vast biography uh, readers can uh, can you know search for you on wikipedia all over same as raquel you know i'm not going to read the biographies i'll let you both talk on your own so rosemary please go ahead and tell us in general about the experience of writing about real stories and characters and then raquel you'll answer the same question once rosemary's done well, I'd first like to begin by acknowledging uh, that the city of Toronto acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The city also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. It's wonderful to always uh, think of that long history and the reparation has to be made, but also the richness that that gives us. So um, the process of writing about other uh, figures, uh, it started in a very strange way, my interest in biography. I had uh, lived in uh, and visited, I'd lived in London and I visited Moscow in 1979. When you think that's high Cold War Moscow, uh, your, your suitcases were searched, etc., in hotels. Uh, and then I visited Prague to see what another version of, of communism might be and came back to Canada to work on Amnesty International. And then somebody who was working with me when I put together a conference called The Writer and Human Rights in Native Amnesty became an editor of Penguin and said, why don't you write a biography of the woman you know well, Elizabeth Smart. I hadn't been interested in biography before because <laughs> uh, I'd grown up you know, in literature where the bio biographical heresy was a mistake. Uh, and I started reading and found, oh my gosh, this was a way of uniting the imagination of a person with the historical and social context. Uh, perhaps the most uh, challenging instance of that was writing about Stalin's daughter. Uh, so I had to figure out how to get inside Stalin's daughter and yet at the same time, you always had to have a sense of the incredibly complex political and social world around her. And I think maybe growing up in Montreal, uh, politics in the broadest sense of the systems of power have always been at the core of my imagination. So that's why biography pulled me in. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And again, how timely to even mention uh, Russia and Cold War and recalling to another area. Raquel, please, uh, on your experiences of writing about real stories and characters. Thank you, Ingrid. A great, a great pleasure to uh, um, stay here with you and with Rosemary. So my, my first attempt at uh, writing a novel based on, on, on a real story was around 15 years ago, 
uh, it was Memory Gaps. And uh, this novel was inspired by Elena Soriano, a Spanish writer who died in the 90s. And um, the widow, the widow would ask uh, for my head to, to compile his wife documents for an archive and, and then say six or seven year, years after, uh, I felt the need to write about the Spanish uh, historical memory. And I thought it would be a good idea to start to start from a, a woman like her. Um, she experienced a lot of suffering after the Spanish Civil War and all the consequences of, and, um, but in this case, in this novel, in Memory Gaps, I decided not to write about the real writer at the end. Uh, I just was inspired by her to make up the main character, Manuela Menendez. And why? I, I don't really know why, you know, perhaps it was, cowardice, uh, perhaps I prefer to be wary uh, because at the time the widow way was uh, still living. But more recently, I finished my last novel, uh, An Archaeology of Goodbyes. Um, sorry for that, but I have sadly to note and it's unpublished yet. Um, and in this case, in Archaeolo An Archaeology of Goodbyes, uh, I have dared uh, to, to do a novel based on a real life in the life of Alberto Ruth Lullier. His story uh, astonished me, and, and, and furthermore, uh, I was really involved in the process. Alberto was an archaeologist uh, born in, in Paris at the beginning of the 20th century, and he was naturalized as Mexican in the 30s. He fought against Machado's regime in Cuba uh, in the 30, at, the, at the end of the 20s and the beginning of the 30s, and was forced to exile to Mexico at the time of the president, President Lázaro Cárdenas, I think is very well known. Uh, there he defend tangible and intangible Mayan cultural heritage, and he died as a director of the Anthropology Museum in, in Mexico City. All this tisera uh, make an exceptional life, and I wanted to write it from, from the most from a more hum, humane, contradictory, and kaleidoscopy view, no? That literature offers. In this case, it's a novel because we talk about uh, with Rosemary. We talk about the difference between the biography and the and the novel, no? Please continue. I mean, on that note, you know. Anyway, uh, I'm saying now I have to ask a question. I want to know what you discussed with Rosemary <laughs> about the intersection of uh, biography and novel. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so, but let's continue also because again, this is a small, uh, like a, a short, brief talk. So I want to make sure that I paint a, a panorama of uh, of uh, the work of both of you with writing about living uh, people. So my second question has to do with how do the stories, or in this case, the characters in real life find you or come to you. So Rosemary, I'd like you to start by telling us or uh, by telling us how especially your last work, which is The Betrayal of Anne Frank, um, that has a very particular story of how it came to you. And in terms of even the, the writing itself and the research. Um, anyway, tell us, uh, because the story of the making of The Betrayal of Anne Frank is a story on its own, you know, or a, a book on its own. So tell us a little bit about how that story came to you, where you're at, I mean, wh how you concluded it. And now that's, you know, that it's, uh, that it's seen the light of day and then we'll go with uh, Raquel the same question. Well let me just say first that uh, my publisher is HarperCollins uh, and um, by one of those um, coincidences serendipity uh, in uh, 2011 uh, I was reading the obituary of Svetlana Aleluyeva in the New York Times and my editor in New York was reading it and she said as we talked about Svetlana she said well that's your next subject I said but I don't speak Russian she said that's really in your favor. I don't want one of these uh, academic uh, um, specialists writing the book. Uh, and so then um, a few years later, 2019, uh, in the meantime, I'd worked on two other projects, but in, in 2019, um, she approached me and said, uh, and, and my agent, uh, would you be interested in taking up this project called the Cold Case Investigation? What had happened in 2016 was this um, uh, filmmaker, Tice Baines, uh, had come up with the idea of writing about uh, the betrayal of Anne Frank. He explained that one day he was standing out in front of the Anne Frank house, so all these people lined up, uh, and he began to think again of Otto Frank, Anne Frank, 
uh, this huge, wonderful poster of her that's in the north part of the city that is so large, it looks almost looks over the city. And he was worried about the shift to the right in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, but also in Europe. And he thought maybe this is the time to answer the question that has never been answered, who betrayed or what had happened really, not who betrayed so much as what happened on the 4th of August, 1944, when the eight people hiding in the annex were discovered. He turned to his friend, um, Peter Van Twisk, who was um, made head of research. And what they both shared was actually their, their grandparents had hidden Jews during the war. Uh, Tace Bayan was able to um, meet up with one of the people, uh, an old man who was in his 90s to describe the basement where he'd hidden, uh, the uh, place where the radio was uh, under the carpet, and he described to Tice all the people who came through his grandparents' house. The same with Peter. He uh, discovered that uh, his father, his grandfather's name, for he was named for his grandfather, so grandfather Peter Van Twisk uh, had... Um, was on the list of uh, resistance um, uh, made by the resistance of those who had helped during the war. Um, Amsterdam has had a very complicated history vis-a-vis -vis the Second World War uh, for reasons that are not obvious and very complex. Amsterdam deported more, a larger percentage of its Jewish population than any other Western European country, uh, over 70%. Of the 107 people deported, 5,500 5, returned. It's uh, unbelievably tragic. Uh, and so they decided they wanted to have somebody who was outside of the whole story. Uh, and their contacts with the Dutch uh, cold case teams and police investigations suggested that this man, Vince Pankoke, would be a good person. And Vince Pankoke uh, was approached and he said, yes. Uh, a while later, he told me that he'd been sitting uh, he'd, he, he had a dream in which he was sitting in his kitchen and this woman dressed in black had come to him and given him a signet ring. And it was a kind of high uh, graduation ring from a university and inside it said 1943. Uh, and obviously uh, she said, you've got to do this, which was an interesting, it hit deep in his psyche. So in 2019, my editor, um, Sarah Nelson, at uh, HarperCollins said in New York said, uh, would you like to write the story? So in fact, all the research was done by the cold case team. There were at least at moments as many as 23 people involved in the research. Uh, Vince was the director, but there was um, Jean Helwig, uh, who was the uh, coordinator. There were a couple of young historians. There was a, a special intelligence officer from Australia, somebody from the Dutch government. It was an incredibly complex and interesting bunch of people. So I flew to Amsterdam in, 2000, in May, 2019. Uh, again, serendipity, it turned out to be the day that uh, the liberation of Holland was celebrated. And uh, all Canadians are always um, revered in, 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 in Amsterdam because it was the Canadians who liberated the, the country. And the uh, mayor, a woman, talked about um, being free to walk the street, to love who you want, to make love. And you couldn't do that in the 1940s. It was a very interesting moment. So I, I took on the project. And um, what made it different, I think, was that uh, Vince was able to use um, FBI techniques because as a retired uh, FBI special investigator who worked on, I mean, this is the this is a grandfather character who's so mild looking, but he'd worked on Colombian drug lords, on Wall Street um, corruption, uh, various, uh, uh, you know, incredibly um, difficult things. We sat in the harbor of, of Amsterdam one afternoon and there was a big ship, obviously a, a very rich uh, mogul's uh, ship. And he said, well, that reminds me of the time I was on the ship with the uh, Colombian drug Oh, Lord. So uh, it was it was fascinating. Um, I spent uh, a month visiting all the um, various uh, the resistance museum, the Holocaust Museum, the zoo where people hid and were hidden um, and all the people who were involved. And my intention was to come back regularly and COVID hit. So with Vince in charge, they used artificial intelligence techniques. So they collected information, uploaded it on the data onto uh, AI, 
and then we're able to integrate it all and find connections which hadn't been obvious before. And I had access to the database, which they called the bookcase. And so on the basis of that, I wrote a narrative which began, I think with I, what threw me was how astonishingly wonderful Otto Frank was. What a remarkable man. So the, the book to, to try to create, recreate the world of Anne Frank begins with Otto Frank in 1933, listening uh, with friends at a dinner party to um, Hitler being um, um, nominated chancellor. And one of the friends says, let's see what the man can do. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And so uh, the, uh, that was the moment when Otto Frank said, we're leaving. He was so prescient. And then his return, I mean, you, so the first 90 pages are recovery of that. But after that, we look at one suspect after another. And Vince had the FBI strategy of uh, motive, knowledge, um, and uh, other things. And, and each time we looked at, a, at people, he dismissed them. And so in the end, I think I looked at 12, no, 14 suspects. Uh, and what was the clincher was not so much all the material around. Um, um, there was the person that the cold case team suggested, and it's a hypothesis, it's not a criminal trial, it's a hypothesis. Uh, there was a letter that uh, Otto Frank received in uh, just after he returned from Auschwitz, which uh, was an anonymous letter. And it said, your address was betrayed to the SD, to the German intelligence, the Nazi intelligence by Arnold Vandenberg. When uh, Vince with his skills recovered a copy of the note that was clearly typed by, proven forensically to be typed by Otto Frank, that wasn't enough. What was uh, important for Vince and the company of cold case investigators was Otto Frank's response. After 1963, Otto Frank didn't want the um, name of the betrayer known. Meep Geese, the remarkable, wonderful Meep Geese, who you admire endlessly, uh, said that Otto knew who betrayed them. He didn't want to betray uh, the children of that person. Uh, he never gave the name, but uh, why would he protect? I mean, there, it's possible he just wanted the whole thing over, but it's also possible that, uh, the, Meep Geese also said that in 19, by 1960, when the new investigation started, the betrayer was already dead. And uh, Arnold Vandenberg died in 1950. We were, I hope, we tried to be so careful because the only reason Arnold Vandenberg would have given a list of anonymous addresses was to save his family and his children from extermination in a concentration camp. Who could not, who would not do that? And so he would, too was extremely a victim of the regime of bureaucratic evil that the Nazis put together in this small, small country of Amsterdam. Wow, Rosemary, there's so much to take in and hear the reflections, you know, in terms of, uh, but especially your relationship with the characters and, and, uh, and, and your viewing, you know, I mean, your empathy with the, with the situations that are uh, unthinkable. Uh, I mean, no, no human being, fortunately, I would like to think would be in a situation like that or in such a dilemma or facing something like that. I mean, this is so extreme. And so, anyway, and at the same time, uh, what rises to to the surface is so beautiful. And like, I mean, you see these gestures of nobility, and and I mean, I'm I'm actually speechless. Um, Rose, I mean, Raquel, Raquel uh, to 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 go again because it's being a 45 minute chat and not a, a long uh, dinner over wine. Um, Raquel, please tell us also now uh, how uh, you found the story for uh, archaeology. Uh, 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 I'm used to saying archaeology. The, 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 mm -hmm. Ay, uh, no, Archaeología de la Dios, perdón, of Archaeology of <laughs> yes, Goodbyes. Uh, yes, exactly. And Archaeology of Goodbyes. Yes, yes. And it's, of course, it, it is a very different story. Um, I, I first heard uh, of the story five years ago uh, when I was ready to start a new novel, that this is always important. I met, I met Claudio, uh, the youngest son uh, of Alberto Ruth. As I said, Alberto Ruth is the archaeologist, no? and the main character of the novel. Um, I met him in, in Lisbon uh, and almost immediately he started to talk about his father. No? Alberto uh, passed away in a hotel of, of Montreal, in, an hotel room in Montreal in 1979. 
and a very young Claudio. He was nine, nine years old at that time. He was witness of his father's agony. So Claudio hadn't uh, been back uh, to Canada since then, but curiously, uh, Faye decided uh, he would return to Montreal a few days uh, before our first encounter in Lisbon. Perhaps for this reason, uh, he began talking to me about his father from, from the, mom the moment we practically just met. And three months later, we, we met again in, in Mexico City and we decided to write the, the novel. Uh, almost before starting uh, to uh, scribble, uh, we, we, were, we thought we were doing something great no? in tandem. It was a uh, good experience. But uh, furthermore, uh, at that time, I was still in mourning for the, for the, the loss of my father. And the narrative was also linked uh, to my decision to write about him. So I've been waiting for a pretest and, and Albert, the Alberto Ruth life story provide, provide it, uh, provided it. I'd like to add. Please do, Rosemary. The opening of uh, an archeology span of goodbyes is stunning. Uh, this is what a novelist can do, which a biographer can't do, because believe it or not, I would say that a biographer makes nothing up. Uh, Rosemary, if you may, this is actually my thank, next question. It's like you read my mind. So please go on it and please, uh, please, please elaborate on that, on, on, on the tools and the resources. Sorry to interrupt, but that's exactly my next question that you're just like, you know, so please go. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Sorry. I just, uh, it's, it's just that... Um, here, here, Raquel sees her character, who's an archaeologist. She imagines that death. I'm, I'm not sure how much comes from Claudio. I don't think a lot. It's uh, uh -huh. he, he has him uh, as he's dying descend into the archaeological uh, pyramid or tomb that that he had had been infamous for excavating, and um, the slow, gradual. Uh, loss of, of animation, of power, his longing to say words to his son, which he can't say, etc. I mean, it's just a very, very powerful scene. Scary as hell to begin a book with that kind of a powerful scene of somebody dying. But that's what a, bio what a novelist can do. Uh, and uh, what a biographer has to do, for instance, when I'm describing uh, the death of Stalin uh, or Stalin's funeral, I can give you five or six versions of that funeral. Um, I'll give you um, Khrushchev's version, uh, which, oh, it was a wonderful moment. You know, Beria's version, well, thank God the guy's gone. Uh, Svetlana's version, and cumulatively you'll get a feeling, but I, I don't take the risk of going inside unless I've been given access by something um, such as, say, a letter in which Svetlana writes to her uh, friend about her father's death. Um, when you start a biography, uh, you turn to the literary executor, and in this case, it was uh, Stalin, uh, Svetlana's daughter, mm -hmm. uh, and you make sure you get permission to quote from all the unpublished sources as well as published, from letters, from, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then you make it understood, and it takes an incredible amount of trust, that you can't allow the executor to read the biography before it's finished uh, because it's not an approved biography. It's going to be independent and your source. So uh, Chris signed letters saying, introducing me to people. And uh, I think the great part of biography is the travel. There's a sub story to all biography, uh, which is almost more interesting than the biography. <laughs> For instance, very quickly, uh, when I was, I went to Ma Moscow, uh, I was told never to go to Moscow without a man. So I took my husband and I took two researchers because I wanted to, who, 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 would, um, who were Anastasia Kostryakova and Elena Romanova, who could do the translation and so on. Uh, and the third night we got a phone call from the landlord of this um, apartment that I'd rented on uh, Kijiji uh, saying that somebody needed to get into the apartment. Who? Well, the police needed to get into the apartment. Why? Well, they were bringing the suspect who was accused of the murder of the um, resident three months prior to your arrival. <laughs> so it was 12 at midnight, 2.30 in the morning. We went outside thinking if this is home invasion, we better be outside. 2.30 in the morning, the cops arrived. 
and the uh, lead detective introduces himself and says, I'm so sorry for the lateness of the hour. And the cops laugh. And I said, Elena, what are they saying? And she says, well, it's a cop joke. I said, what are they saying? She says, they're saying, in the old days, we didn't need to apologize. <laughs> I thought, Svetlana, you set me up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Rosemary, this is, uh, I mean, again, um, I don't want to put my own input, Raquel, uh, staying in on the, on, the, on the genre aspect of it, uh, Raquel, you actually, um, in your, because again, uh, Archaeología de, 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 de la Dios, or the archaeology, uh, an archaeology of goodbyes is a work of fiction, even though it's based on a real life, but it's a fictionalized life, um, you actually yes. use, you include the, 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 the strategy or the literary device of autofiction, you yourself are a fictitious character in the novel, you know, mm -hmm. as well, as Rosemary, um, when she was, um, at BAM, she met Tomas Eloy Martinez, who has, uh, in Santa Vita, Tomas Eloy is also a fictitious Tomas Eloy in his own character. It's the first time that I've seen this, uh, this uh, strategy mm -hmm. done really well. He's a journalist, but it's a fictitious one. So Raquel, tell us about, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, how, your decision to do this and your own relationship with the characters, you know, the real Raquel, the auto fiction, you know, tell us about mm -hmm. the decision to, to include this and why you included it and, and how it worked out in the novel. That is never easy to do, but <laughs> I did. So yes, as, as, as you will say in an archaeology of good vibes, uh, it is possible to distinguish uh, different layers. No? One, one is Alberto's root fictionalized biography. No, I tried to do that um, from his childhood to, to his deathbed. No? Even if, if the book started with the, with the deathbed, but the second layer is the Claudius, uh, Claudius and his Alberto's son. Um, Claudius and the narrator frenzy, the narrator is Raquel. <laughs> and, uh, and their encounters around the world talking about history, art, uh, and even uh, geopolitics, no? Uh, we talked, for example, about the invasion of Crimea, no? That now is, uh, is, <laughs> is in, the, in the actuality. So it's very, it's very in the focus. And, and the third layer uh, is the construction of the novel itself, so which it is, is, um, is at the same time the leitmotif of continuing the relation between Alberto's son and the narrator. No? And gradually, it is possible to see the, the sca uh, scaffold that make up the novel. Um, it's blueprint, um, it's uh, its decision, it's, it's, it's worth, uh, also, even even its gap, and also its possibility of of demolition as well. So my my desire uh, to tell the story, as, as I said, it, this is also very important. Always, no, it was so strong and compelling. Uh, but I was always concerned that I could not only write the story if the if the son Claudio helped me. And from the beginning, I needed um, his voice and his testimonies. And in this case, it, it, it's different, no? Because I have I have read your book, and 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 about the death, there are different different uh, point of view. But in this case, the point of view uh, is uh, I use uh, practically in the oral source. I use the voice of of Claudio, no? And. It, it took it took a whole year to collect the pieces of a puzzle, no? That we exchanged daily via uh, email or mobile from, uh, phone from the each side of the Atlantic. Uh, then our path crossed uh, in such distinct uh, cities, such as Mexico City, Guadalajara, but Guadalajara in Mexico, no, in Spain, uh, Moscow as well, Moscow again, <laughs> uh, and, and Madrid, for example, no. I try to put my, um, myself in his shoes, uh, and it's not easy, but I try to understand the man his father has been, explore the interstices of his life, his revolutionary anger, uh, the curiosity that led him to extract traces of, of a Mayan civilization from the jungle, uh, but imagination alone could never enable uh, me to discern no? what, what it, all of these means. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you. And again, this is imagination filling the gaps that history can fill. That's, you know, a really, a really uh, 
important and I, in my opinion probably the most challenging aspect of, of, of putting a work like this uh, together artistically of crafting uh, this work of art is to imagine or to let your imagination fill in the gaps that history cannot uh, or that history uh, is limited to the same in a sense with journalism but again not my opinion uh, not about my opinion about uh, listening to you so we have 15 minutes remaining and I think uh, that it would be nice to end uh, to end on this particular question so uh, that has to do with both of the characters both um, Alberto and Svetlana live in the shadow of their fathers both of them have that in common you know which is uh, which is a very particular thing of, uh, of uh, uh, and by the way I'd like to mention also we have uh, we have uh, one of the program uh, one of the um, the writers that we have a Blumet coming is a daughter of Carlos Fuentes who will be interviewed by the daughter by Marta Batis that Rosemary knows just to plug in a little bit uh, Marta a Mexican Canadian writer also and she also is the daughter of the founder of the of the orchestra of Mexico City so I mean Marta and and and, and these two writers have a huge father figures as well so I think as an interview will be because it's something that will mark you uh, you know for the for your life you know so on that note you know and again a little plug for an event coming up at Blumet at the in the in-person uh, festival um uh, Rosemary, if we could start with you, um, how do you feel? I mean, obviously, I mean, the, the, that's in the title of the novel that she's not Vetlana, she's Stalin's daughter. Tell us a little bit about uh, about that idea of like, who are you when you have, you know, this shadow over you being cast over you? Well, uh, in fact, of course, having the shadow of Stalin over you is quite a different matter entirely. But she did say, which uh, was quoted in the obituary, no matter where I go to an island to Australia, I will always be the political prisoner of my father's name. That kind of hooked me and I decided I wanted to, um, to, to understand what that would mean. Because if one looks carefully at my work, mostly I've written biographies of women because I'm interested in the, <laughs> yeah, Margaret, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, I was uh, thinking um, when I went to, I mean, the, the wonderful thing about writing biography, and it's interesting that Raquel has crossed the territory in a way. I'd, I'd want to know whether Claudio uh, liked the portrait uh, at the, uh, when the book was finished uh, by involving real people. But one of the things you do when you're writing biography, first of all, you collect all the CIA, FBI, KGB files you can get. <laughs> uh, then you start doing your historical research into the time, but then you get to meet people. And the, the I must have interviewed about forty people for this Fedlata book. And one was uh, Stalin's grandson, Sasha Berdonsky. Sasha Berdonsky was her brother's Vasily's son, uh, who uh, had been abandoned by his father in effect, and so um, he was not fond of his grandfather. And he did say that. Um, you know, if you're if you're the child of of somebody like Stalin, one of the world's dictators, you either have to love them completely, or abandon them completely. But Svetlana got caught in the middle. She both loved her father and was appalled by him. So she reached past back to an almost 19th century Rus Russian sensibility, which absolutely intrigued me. She was spiritual. She was compassionate. She was also a pain in the neck some of the time. But, uh, you know, it, it was interesting um, because she could never completely abandon her father. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, I can imagine. Raquel, um, tell us. Yes, in, in, in the case of an archaeology of goodbyes, I think that the question is related with Claudius and, and Alberto, no? Because, of course... Um, the idea of, the, of this huge... Yes, of this yes, it's, it's with the sound, yes, I think... Of course, it is a question that only the, the, the son, no? the son Claudio can try to answer. Uh, but of course, I can explain my own uh, perception. Um, I think the impact of the father's uh, life in, in, on his younger son is clear. Uh, if we talk in terms of political engagement or cultural curiosity, um, the, the son for example, uh, the son also went to, to work to Chiapas, eh, that was this, the place where in 1952, uh, his father made his most important discovery, the, to the tomb of Pakal, and it's that tomb that, that is in the beginning of the, of the, of the novel. No? Um, but on the other hand, uh, even if Claudio recognized himself as a man who, who always found difficult uh, to deal with his feelings, he needed to, to remove the, the thorn of guilt because he, he always blamed himself no, for, for not being able to find a doctor 
on time in the corridors of the Montreal Hotel. Um, uh, and we agree when we started to work in the novel, we agree that, uh, that, that this exercise of writing his father lights could be uh, therapeutic and repair the harm that he believed he had caused. No? But uh, uh, to, to finish about the expectation, no? because, uh, because Rosemary talked about, talk about that, and I think um, it's, a, it's a great difficulty, no? it's a big difficulty uh, when you are writing and you are uh, thinking in what is the expectation no, of the of the family and um, it is very complicated to to write a, a, a novel around a biography and anticipate what uh, the very close family might like and and it was still more if if you I and mean, in my in my case um, what what happened and I persuaded Claudio to be part of the of the fiction, no. So this is more complicated. But of, of course, he he had read the novel uh, Rosemary. So and we and we were working um, about different chapters. And but I want to to be very clear that in my case, the point of view that I choose was the point of view of the youngest son. Probably if I I just started to. To add, for example, to other the other two two son son, it, it will it will they will say that uh, they are not agree probably with this vision of the the father. No, that is so interesting, Raquel. I mean, everything um, everything is really interesting. I just want to just to wrap up. I mean, I would like to talk about the biographies of both of you to finish. Uh, just you know, uh, we're talking about uh, both of you as women that are you know, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, uh, and then the purpose of this series of conversations of writers between or this dialogue between Canada and Spain. Rosemary is deeply connected to Latin America. She's married to a Chilean. I mean, she she knows Latin American culture, literature, uh, like I think better than any Canadian. And Raquel also is a uh, I. I, I I think of the same way Raquel is also Latin America, even, uh, even though, you know, she was Spanish Latin American, you know. So, I mean, in particular, my side of the world, you know, but both of you are Canadian and Canadian and Spanish citizens, but also very inter international and with the international the sense that you're women of the world, both of you. You know, Rosemary, tell us a little bit about your relationship with the Spanish language in particular. Raquel, I'd like you to do the opposite with Canada, what Canada means to you. And in particular, that's the city of Montreal features so prominently in the story or the fate of Claudio and uh, and uh, and uh, and Alberto, you know, because the, the death of the father happens at actually at the Hyatt Hotel here in Montreal, like the one at Place des Arts, you know. So uh, tell us about your relationship with other countries in the world, but in particularly the the the, the connection between Canada and Spain. So Rosemary, tell us, and, and then Raquel, and we finish. Um, I consider that uh, in uh, the, that uh, the Americas are a kind of continental house, and Canada is the attic. Uh, that uh, in this continental house where the, uh, the main floor is occupied by uh, a, a world power, uh, we have to be careful because things can be put in the attic and assume that they can be taken anytime, such as water. Uh, and I have always identified with Latin America and Central America for that matter, uh, as the part of the continental house that can share my anxiety about control, even though, of course, the experience of Latin America has been brutal uh, uh, as the product of everything from the Condor project where um, all the countries, uh, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, etc., engaged in, um, in dictatorships and were supported by the Americans in their anti-communist uh, uh, push. Um, but uh, when I, my first trip uh, after uh, coming back from England uh, and France, where I lived for a couple of years, I was saying with Raquel, we both went to the University of Sussex. There must be something there that uh, in, infected us. Um, I went to uh, Mexico to see Teotihuacan. I went to uh, Guatemala to see Tikal and to Peru to see Machu Picchu. Uh, and uh, in each case, um, encountered the people as well. Uh, and so um, I began to work with Amnesty International and with the writers. I put together this conference I mentioned and uh, became a, a good friend of, of Eduardo Galliano. And Eduardo uh, in some ways shaped my vision of Latin America. Oddly enough, he wasn't uh, that fond of open veins of Latin America. He was fond of his novels. 
uh, and also of, of course, Memories of Fire, those wonderful collections. And then Tomas Eloy Martinez and, you know, the variety of people. And uh, I wrote, I ended up writing a book about Cuba uh, with my husband Juan. We went to Cuba for a month and uh, decided we were going to tell the story of Cuba, not from the point of view of the tourist who goes there or the American and European who are looking for politics, but from allowing the Cubans to tell their own story. <laughs> And I think it became a wonderful book called Grace Under Pressure. And so I'm very fond of, of Cuba. And it is it is a wonderful book. And, and especially, you know, to, to go there also with the, Rosemary uh, uh, didn't mention her husband is a musician on top of it. And Rosemary is quite a good dancer and, a, and, a, and, uh, yeah. and an appreciator. Yeah, we met Conta Segundo, <laughs> who had a, a, a cheek on each knee. <laughs> anyway, uh, and Ra Raquel needs some time to talk. Yes, so Raquel. And there are a lot of things to do, no? Because we are, uh, yes, a lot of things in common, no? Uh, Rosemary, because I, I also were, uh, was a friend of, of Eduardo Galeano when we lived, uh, because yes, my ex, uh, ex uh, was um, very friend, very close, a very close friend of him, and we lived uh, five years in in Montevideo. So, and he was uh, still still living so it's very sad now we, we lost a very good friend but Sorry, yes. did you did you know Daniel Viglietti yes yes yeah, me too but, yeah. but yes but uh, I I have heard a lot of music and everything but yeah but friend what our friend was Eduardo yeah. and Elena as well no his wife so, but about the relation between Canada and Spain and what happened with, I think the literature uh, is fascinating because I never thought in the idea to go to Canada. I had never been there. So, and after writing, when I started to write this, this book, of course, I, I did my research. I went to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Mayan area again. I spent one month and then I went to the Palenque. I went to... Paris, I went to uh, all the scenarios of the novel, but I finished and I, I, I never been in Montreal, but as literature is, uh, is always um, opening uh, windows, uh, I asked for a literature, a literature grant and I will go to Canada in, in uh, August. I will go uh, to spend two months doing a, a literary a residence and I am very happy now. So it's it's like part of the novel. So you finish and you have finished the novel, but the novel is um, uh, is unpublished yet. But anyway, it's giving you more things, no? And one of the best things that I want to to achieve uh, will be to to go to Canada and to meet you in person. So this is <laughs> be very nice. You should come. I'm going to a festival in Newfoundland. The winter set in summer. You should come to Newfoundland. <laughs> yes. okay. Oh, we will arrange this as soon as we uh, finish the talk. You know, I think Raquel is, is supposed to be here in uh, in Montreal, but we're going to do. Uh, but obviously, I'm going. I'm going to send her to Toronto. You know, in a little uh, a mission to to meet wonderful people is there. And obviously, Rosemary, you're at the top of the list. You know. So on that note, and I would like to thank Asse also for the sponsor for the for the financing of all our wonderful projects. You know, the people which at the end of the day, this idea of Spain and Frank and uh, Canada being guests of honor in Frankfurt and the finance and the faith that Canada and Spain have in their authors and you know this talk would not have been possible without this funding you know so again I cannot thank you uh, th thank you know uh, the, the agents and the governments for having these policies so that we can uh, so that we can do these interactions and these meetings between our cultures and these fabulous exchanges with it at, at the end of the day I love seeing that you guys have so much in common because that says that I did my job in a way you know not just putting wonderful friends together you know at around the dinner table but rather you know two women two powerful women two brilliant women you know that have so much to say and different stages of their career different points in their lives you know but but so many um um connections and points in common and and again uh, as i mentioned also more friends uh, to uh, to make and and to uh, continue enjoying life you know which is uh, what uh, this is about at thank you thank you so much to both of you it was lovely to uh, to talk to you and uh, to everyone else i hope you continue uh, enjoying the lovely series uh, that we're putting here together with uh, a lot of uh, cariño as we say in spanish to to do this rapprochement between canada and spain thank you so much muchas gracias ingrid Gracias. Gracias. Gracias, Rosemary. <laughs>